Well, good morning. Uh, so glad that you're here on this cold, wet, rainy uh, Sunday morning that is uh, uh, buffered by 60 degrees and 60 degrees. I don't know what we did to deserve today, but I'm glad you're here. Um, the, uh, this morning, uh, as, as Tyler already mentioned, is a communion morning, which if you don't know the inner workings of the logistics of a worship service, that means that the sermon time is shrunk, okay? So uh, we're, we're going to do all that we need to do in about 15 minutes today. All right. So in an effort to, to help keep me accountable to, to that and to also kind of help you know where we're going, I'm going to go ahead and give you the table of contents for the sermon today. All right. Uh, we're going to start with existential spiral. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> we're going to move into ancient wisdom after that. We're going to then uh, have an asterisk. We're going to have a disclaimer section. Uh, then we're going to go to outer space. And then we're going to wrap it all up with the prophetic voice of Taylor Swift. Sound good? All right, here we go. I, I, I just saw my Swifties light up, all right? Uh, okay, so uh, as, as the beginning of our existential spiral, we're going to do some trivia time here at Grace. Uh, now, the staff was talking about this earlier this week, and uh, we decided that, uh, Randall Ray, you do not get to participate. Uh, because you're going to ruin trivia time for everyone else, okay? So this is for everybody minus Randall. We believe you're all very smart, bright people, but Randall knows some weird stuff, okay? <laughs> so we're, we believe you're all very, very smart. Okay, so number one, who is the 14th president of the United States? Fantastic. Okay. Randall, did you know that one? No? Okay. Wow, we stumped Randall. Okay. So the that's a big deal to be the President of the United States. President of the United States, 14th, uh, Franklin Pierce. So we'll lock that one away for, for a trivia night. All right, second question. Uh, this, is a, this is relevant, right? Uh, everybody, if you have a cell phone, pull it out, hold it up. You got a cell phone? If you're looking at it right now, turn it off before you put it up. Yeah, good, good. Okay, a lot of people have these, right? We depend on these. These are important, right? Who invented the cell phone? Not quite, but that, that will be relevant later. Anybody? Who invented the cell phone? Who? Did you look it up on your cell phone? Yeah, you did, yeah. <laughs> Sarah Clay's right, Martin Cooper, right? But we didn't know that unless we used the invention that he gave us to, to look that up, right? Martin Cooper invented the cell phone. Third and final question, who is the fastest person on earth? This is a big accomplishment, right? We should know this. Usain Bolt, used to be, used to be, a fella named Noah Lyles. Yeah, Usain Bolt used to be the fastest person on earth. Now it's a, a fella named Noah Lyles. Here's the thing. Those are really big accomplishments, right? I mean, who, who thinks, we're not getting into politics. Who thinks becoming the president's a pretty big deal, right? It's a big deal. Who, who thinks that inventing something as monumental as a cell phone, something that we use way too much every single day, billions and billions of dollars, unbelievable help and, and hurt has happened, but who believes that's a big deal? I mean, the fastest person on earth. You can literally say, no one's faster than me. Like, as a, you know, when, when you're a kid, when you're an eight-year-old little boy, like, that's a big deal, right? Being the fastest person on the playground is a big deal, but the fastest person on earth is huge. And yet, all three of these people, without Sarah cheating, all three of these people were unknown to us. Now you think about it, to be the very top of your field, to be the very best, to be the leader of, of, of the most powerful nation on earth, and, and we don't even know who they are. It's amazing when we think about that sort of thing and we start to put our toil and strife and the things that we work on, the things we focus on, the things that we spend our time on each and every day to hold those up against these massive accomplishments and realize that we don't even know who those people are. And then my spiral starts to go, well, who the heck's going to ever know who I am or what I did? I'll bring it a little more personal. I can tell you about my grandfather guy named George Ingram. I can tell you lots of stories about him. I, I, I knew him. He was alive when I was alive. I can't tell you a thing about his dad. I didn't know him. I don't know his accomplishments. 
I, I, I can't tell you about his dad. And this is my family. I don't know who they were. I don't know what they did. I don't know what they were about, their, their accomplishments and their achievements in the world. I can't tell you anything about it. And so, again, when I, when I start to put my life in perspective with even those people who, who are important in my family, in my tree, everything feels really small and meaningless even. When I start to think about the things that I spend my days toiling on, working on, doing, it starts to feel really small and really, really insignificant, almost as the uh, writer of Ecclesiastes would say, it's just meaningless. Vanity, vanity, all all is vanity. There's a word for this, it's called nihilism, where nothing matters. And so we begin to move into our existential spiral. See, most commonly, there are two things that take up our energy, our time, our anxiety, two things that we feel are, 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 are so significant that we, that we focus our time uh, and our money and our toil on. And those two things are this, the pursuit of significance, wanting to mean something to someone, and oftentimes mean something to many, and that pursuit of significance is, you know, it's, it's, it's how much of our life are we trying to be significant? How much of our lives, how much of our work, how much of our effort do we spend trying to do something that somebody will notice, let alone that somebody will remember? And then the second thing that, that, that we spend so much of our attention and time and focus and anxiety on is a preoccupation with minutia. So it's sort of both ends of the spectrum, right? It's these big grand ideas of who we are and who we can become, and it's these microscopic micro annoyances and obsessions that truly don't matter. For me, confession time, for me, uh, those things have to do with the cleanliness of my house, all right? I've got three kids. I've got an 18-year-old, a 16-year-old, and a 12, about to be 12-year-old. And they will tell you what drives dad crazy leaving their stuff everywhere, right? How many people can relate to that? Thank you, I'm not alone, right? I feel seen. But it drives me crazy, and I get so obsessed with these micro annoyances, and I spend so much time and so much energy and so much brain space. Nora, pick up your shoes. Patrick, pick up this. Uh, Mary Claire, just come in. Mary Claire's pretty good, but Mary Claire, come and, you know, like unload the dishwasher. And, and, and I, I spend so much of my day so much of my energy, so much of my time, just these little, 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 little things, these micro annoyances. I was having a conversation with Todd uh, and John uh, the other morning, and one of them, I won't tell you who, ran a stop sign and got a ticket. And I told them, I said, you're the kind of person I can't stand on the road. I don't want you to roll through the stop sign, stop at the stop sign, count to three, and then go. It drives me crazy in my neighborhood when I see people do that. I want to chase them down. <laughs> I do. I don't do it, but I want to. It's true. And you have those things too, and if you, and if you don't, you're lying. Right? We all have those. And we spend so much time and energy and effort on these things. So it's, it's the big stuff and the little stuff. And we get so preoccupied with the pursuit of significance or the preoccupation with minutia. Section two, ancient wisdom. There's a phrase in Latin called memento mori, memento mori, which means you too shall die. There's a very long tradition, uh, both in the Greek and the Roman world, that even uh, sees itself up to today, where, uh, and and a lot of folks will say that it started uh, with Roman generals after major victories, after massive victories, they'd, they'd be paraded in, uh, under their triumphal arch. And people would whisper, Momento mori, you too will die. There's even a tradition that, that when a new pope is elected, and this one might be apocryphal, I've heard, I've heard both sides of this, but when a new pope is elected, someone walks behind them as they're leaving the Sistine Chapel, about to walk into the papal porch to be received by the masses, 
and, and, and the tradition goes that someone follows them and whispers in their ear, memento mori, you too shall die. Maybe this isn't the ancient wisdom section, maybe this is continuing the existential spiral, right? In, in Buddhism, uh, I, I came across this principle uh, probably about four or five years ago and uh, this principle is a, is a core teaching in, in, in Buddhism called the five remembrances. Here are the five remembrances. See if this gets you excited about today. I am of the nature to grow old. I am of the nature to get sick. I am of the nature to die. Everyone and everything is of the nature to change. My actions are my, own, are my one true belonging. We all grow old. We all get sick. We're all going to die. Everything's going to change. And the only thing that I have are my actions. And we continued the spiral. This morning, our text from the lectionary comes from uh, the book of Isaiah, a, a prophet in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, chapter 40 of Isaiah. Amanda read the happy, hopeful part of that verse uh, this morning. Uh, but again, uh, I'm, I'm in the mood for existentialism, so here we go. Isaiah 40, uh, verse 21, and we'll read through uh, about uh, 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sets above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the, he who stretches out the heaven like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in? Who brings princes to naught? and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely they are planted, scarcely sown, scarcely, they are, scarcely, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? And that's where we'll stop for the moment. You know, in, in this passage, it's, we're, we're, we're seeing this, this perspective, right? It's talking about princes, talking about global leaders. We're talking about the most powerful people in the world of Isaiah at the moment. And they are being compared to grasshoppers. They're being compared to a weak, a weakly rooted new plant that with just a they wither and they blow away in the wind. The most powerful, the kings of Babylon and Persia, the, 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 the Greek and Roman empires, the presidents and rulers of our world whew, compared to God. The disclaimer. Through our existential spiral, I hope that you feel small. I hope that you see your toil. I hope, as I say these words, I, I see my toil, the things that I get so worked up about, the things I think about all the time, very small. Things that consume me. But here's the asterisk, here's the disclaimer. There are some things that matter deeply. And in the moment, they matter deeply. Not only in the moment, but for long periods of time, they matter deeply. The loss of a loved one, war and famine, 
persecution, a terrible diagnosis, abuse. These things matter and they matter deeply and these are not the things that I'm talking about this morning. So I want you to not hear this, this playful existential spiral, which I bet you've never heard that phrase before. This playful existential spiral is, is not talking about those things. Those things matter deeply. They should be handled with care, deep care, respect, uh, dignity, and attention. So as, as we move through that, I do, want you, I do want you to hear that. If you're experiencing those things, this sermon is not speaking to those things uh, and is not minimizing those things. So I do, want you to, I do want you to hear that clearly. But for most of the things that we get worked up about on a daily basis, most of the things we strive and we toil for, that we spend hours and months and years grinding away at, when we think about the significance, when we think about the grand scheme of things, when we think about the God in heaven and us as grasshoppers, all of a sudden the things that seem to be such a big deal tend to seem so, so, so much smaller. Fourth, let's go to outer space. Uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity of meeting a, a, a real-life astronaut, like a NASA astronaut. She literally went into space. Like, she floated around and did all the cool things. I guess she ate astronaut ice cream. I don't know, but, like, she did the cool things that you do in space. She has been in space. And uh, when I got to meet her, she had talked about um, this, this really fascinating uh, idea that has only come about in, uh, since the space program began. Uh, and this idea is called the overview effect. Some of you may have heard, it, heard of it. Um, the overview effect is this. Uh, when the first astronauts went to space and saw that beautiful, you know, the iconic photo, Earth rising, right? Earth coming uh, out of the darkness, and, and, and the photo is called Earth rising. It was one of the first pictures that was ever taken in space. The, the overview effect is what happened to those astronauts and many astronauts after that when they came back down, after having seen the earth from that perspective, from, from maybe even God's perspective. They said they, there was, a, there was a, 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 a literal shift in how they saw and interacted in the world. There was a literal shift in how their brains worked. Their brains were functioning differently because of that experience. As they dove down deeper into this idea that they later named the overview effect, they found that by, 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 by getting above the situation, above their personal situations, global situations, political situations, social situations, that they could no, no longer see and interact with those situations in the same way because they were able to get perspective. And it literally changed the chemistry of their brains. Uh, others have uh, talked about this overview effect as what's called the cosmic perspective. A simple definition of this is the, comic pers uh, pers the cosmic perspective enables us to see beyond our circumstances, allowing us to transcend the primal search for food, shelter, and sex. It gives us perspective. It helps us see what we can't when we're here. Beauty does that, and so does pain, if we allow it to. See, the, the, the beauty of seeing earth rising allows them to be inspired, breaks through our modern sensibilities, breaks through our, our biases, uh, breaks through our um, pessimism, and, and, we, and we have to see the world in a different way because of that. Pain does the same thing, actually. Pain does the same thing. Have you ever been really sick for like, like a week, and then you wake up one day and you're not? Right, like water tastes sweet. Just take a glass of tap water and you're like, this is good water. People aren't quite as annoying. Your clothes fit a little better. Depends what kind of sick you are. You may have lost some weight during that, but there's, there's, some, <laughs> there's some things happening there, right? Because, because you've been in a place of pain. Have you ever had, ever had tragedy? 
happened. I remember, I remember uh, right after the um, Newtown um, shootings back in, I think it was 2012, uh, at the time, it was uh, President Obama, and, and he said, um, hold, your, hold your loved ones a little closer tonight. And that resonated, right? I mean, I remember that so vividly. And I remember doing that very thing because, because deep pain also gives us perspective. Taylor Swift, the moment you've all been waiting for. I, I love Taylor Swift, all right? I'm just, I'm just going to be for real, for real. I love Taylor Swift. She's fantastic. I wish I had like $10,000. I would have gone to the Aero store. It would have been awesome, right? <laughs> Here's uh, one of my favorite songs off of her album, Lover, that was released in 2019. is a song called Calm Down. Now, it's funny that she released a song in 2019 and... and, and you know, she appears for 12 seconds during a football game and everybody's freaking out. Get Taylor Swift off my TV. You know, like it's this big, like <laughs> scary thing because this strong, successful woman's on TV for 12 seconds. But, you know, that song's kind of prophetic. It's like, just calm down. Stephen, calm down. Yes, they shouldn't have pumped the brake at the stop sign, but calm down. Yes, Nora's shoes are in the floor again. You've told her literally 17,000 times to put them up. And, and we got to keep doing that as parents, right? But the way we engage with, calm, calm down. Your work matters. The things you do in this world matter. But, but keep it in perspective. Our pursuits are, 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 are you know, we want to be titans of industry or titans of this or, or, or make these global. That's great. Let's do that. But let's keep perspective on it too. Calm down. There are scary things happening in this world right this moment. And we need to care about those things. And we need to work towards justice and goodness and love in this world. But calm down. Because getting all wrapped up, getting anxious, getting so worked up that you're freaking out at a stop sign does no good for anyone. So calm down. And Taylor, I would argue, is saying the same thing the prophet Isaiah is saying. Calm down. I'm seeing this from a different perspective. You see this tyrant king, I'm God still, remember? The, the five remembrance is telling us that everybody's gonna die, everybody's gonna get sick, you're gonna get gray hair or lose it all. It's a way of actually getting perspective. Okay, that's gonna happen. I don't have to freak out. Just, just calm down. Memento mori, you too shall die. The overview effect. Can we rise above and see this world? See this world for the beauty and the goodness that is out there and not be so consumed by the micro, by the minutia that tends to occupy so much of our brain space, our emotions, and our work. Functionally, each of these pieces of wisdom point to the same thing, it's perspective. It's understanding what matters most and what matters very little, and the call to get above, or to get an overview, to find our perspectives, and in turn, find the peace and space and perspective so that when things really do matter, when the things that really matter do come along, we have both the margin and the energy to deal with those, to give them the time, the attention, the toil, the brain energy. That they, that they actually do deserve. So everybody take a deep breath. You don't know who the pre 14th president of the United States is, and that's okay. You too shall die. That's okay. But you got a lot of loving, a lot of grace, and a lot of beautiful work to do in this world. Go and do it without anxiety and just calm down. Let's pray.